This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Stay tuned for more details. My last video was a re-review on Mega Man X, the Super Nintendo classic that revolutionized the Mega Man franchise. It also happened to be one of my favorite games of all time, for reasons I delved into in the previous video. If you haven't seen that, I would definitely say it's worth checking out. As promised, today we're following that up with a look at the sequel, Mega Man X2, which was also released on the Super Nintendo just one year after the first game in 1994. Of the first four X games, this one deserves the re-review the absolute most because the video I did on X2, for reasons we can talk about at the end, is really not one I'm happy with, and that's because, spoiler alert, Mega Man X2 is yet another one of my favorite games of all time. I mentioned in a previous video that sequels are an interesting thing for video games because there are many ways to do it. You could do something totally different, you could refine what already existed, or you could take a first entry that was lacking and fix a lot of the problems. Mega Man X is the kind of original that didn't really have that many problems, a product of the game being built off of the groundwork laid in the first six Mega Man games in the NES. X2 is a sequel that, for justifiable reasons, went with the second route, refining what already existed, and we'll explore how the game goes about that and its controls, mechanics, and structure. With that said, let's dive in to Mega Man X2. As if that title screen wasn't enough to impress you, let me spell it out for you. Mega Man X2 comes out guns blazing. The original Mega Man X opens up a bit slowly on Dr. Light's warning about X, and then the game just starts you out on the stage. In X2, the game begins with exposition telling us that it's been six months since the defeat of Sigma in X1, however, that didn't completely wipe out all of his followers. Sigma was once the leader of the Maverick Hunters, and with him going Maverick, that basically placed Zero as a temporary leader during the events of X1, but Zero died at the end of the game, so who better to pick up the slack than the Maverick Hunter who defeated Sigma, Mega Man X? In the last six months, X and his crew have been hunting down the remaining Mavericks who pledged loyalty to Sigma. X is a total badass in this game. I realize this is an SNES game from 1994, but just look at the setup of the intro stages for X1 and X2. In X1, you were fighting a losing battle against Sigma's forces that attacked the Central Highway. In X2, X and his comrade are traveling on hoverbikes to the last remaining factory the Mavericks are hiding in. We've got them on the ropes this time. These guys are running from you in this game. Nobody messes with Mega Man X anymore. Just look at this cutscene you get when pressing start. X rides his bike straight into the enemy. That's just so cool, what can I say? The intro stage from X1 was a masterfully designed tutorial, but the one in X2 is doubly effective, dare I say teaching you the basics of lining your shots up at multiple angles, wall jumping and charging in very little time. It lasts like 40 seconds if you know what you're doing while still having active obstacles like this floor you need to jump over and these closing walls you need to escape from. It's a frantic, action-packed stage, and I love that because the Mavericks are just throwing everything they've got at you, even this giant robot, but they all fall before Mega Man X. Once that stage is cleared, we get more insight in the new story. Three loyal Sigma followers, now called the X-Hunters, have realized that X is just too powerful and they need to accelerate their plans of bringing back both Sigma and Zero. They send out eight new Mavericks for X to defeat, but when he's clearly kicking their asses too, they begin a new plan. The three of them, Sergeys, Violin, and Agile, will challenge X directly, each of them holding a major part of Zero. If X can defeat them, then he'll get Zero back, but if they win, then Zero will be brought back as a number for the Mavericks. X is more than ready to take on the challenge and get his best friend back with the help of Dr. Kane, the guy who discovered X in the first place. This being his first on-screen appearance in the series. He doesn't do much other than seemingly direct Maverick Hunter operations and has the capacity to rebuild Zero, but it's nice the game included him as he was only mentioned in the manual of X1. Clearly, X2 is much more in-game storytelling than X1. I said that game got the bare essentials to tell a memorable story, but X2 includes a lot more context and interesting cutscenes. Well for its time, it's obviously primitive now. But it's a clear improvement over the previous game, as all the necessary information to understand the plot is all in the game. When that setup is done, you're left with the same structure as the first game. You have eight new Mavericks to fight, with this game clearly leaning into that world building that made the first game unique as we see this giant world map take up the screen and the boss select, showing how each level connects in the grand scheme of things. When diving into the game proper, you'll find out that controlling X is basically identical to how it was before. There is one critical change, and that would be that X, despite losing his armor between games, can still use the dash functionality from the leg parts of his first armor. I don't think you needed to get through X1's Maverick stages, but in X2 I'm glad this is a default ability because the designers can use it to its full potential for both the item game and for the platforming as X2's level design is much more geared towards precision than X1. 
Just look at the wide gaps in the platforms in Morph Moth stage at the beginning, or these searchlights you need to avoid in Magma Centipede stage. Or this scanner segment for that matter, where you have to avoid getting caught and avoid getting hit by these blocks for risk of making the coming mini-boss more challenging. The game is littered with designs like this, both horizontally and vertically, creating a robust set of stages. With some pretty cool set pieces like X riding a hover bike to find a missile silo as it's about to launch a missile and he just hitches a ride and blasts it straight out of the sky. Besides all that, X2 handles basically the exact same as he did in X1. Running, jumping, wall jumping, dashing, shooting, it's all the same. Now, this is nothing to be afraid of, because Mega Man sequels don't usually evolve that much, but add and refine what they can. In the case of X2, you have the dash at default, and the biggest reason that X2 is one of my favorite games. That reason is, Mega Man X2 is home to the most complex routing in the Mega Man X series. But what do I mean by routing? Back in 2015, I would think up ways to get through X1 through X4 with a minimal amount of backtracks. X2 and onward still having 8 heart tanks and a varying number of sub tanks you still need to plan out how you're going to get to, like you did in the first game. Mega Man games have allowed you to play stages in any order since the first game, but the X series introducing so many collectibles increases the complexity that goes into your decision as to which stage to play next. Games like Mega Man 5 and Mega Man 6 do have in-stage collectibles, just not to the X series' extent. With X2 having the highest amount of options of any X game, let's first discuss what my thought process was when thinking up these least backtracking orders. As I type this, I feel like it sounds kind of pretentious. I don't mean to call myself some kind of god-tier player or that I invented these strats. I'm sure someone posted these routes on the internet before me, but I didn't consult the internet when crafting the routes I took when I first started playing and replaying these games in 2015. That's all I'm trying to say. Anyway, it starts by beating a stage that's easy to beat. A chill penguin from X1, for example. Then thinking about what collectibles you can get with the loadout you just got from that stage. I then go to Storm Eagle and dash jump for the heart tank and head parts of the first armor. The foot and head parts combined will allow me to get the arm parts in Flame Mamma stage while also being able to use his weakness on him. I've gone over my preferred stage order from X1 numerous times, and while you could do things differently, there really wouldn't be a reason to. Technically, you could just start with Launch Octopus's stage, which requires nothing to get its sole collectible, a heart tank, but starting on a stage this difficult offers the player no strategic advantage whatsoever. It's a little harder to battle Boomer Kawanger without his weakness, but the advantage is not having to go back to Spark Mandrill stage for 30 seconds to get a sub tank. So it's a combination of a small number of stage revisits and doing so in a way that's effective for the player. Now, this leads into X2 where the item game is at its best. I'm displaying my X2 route on screen right now. It goes Wire Sponge, Wheel Gator, Flame Stag, Overdrive Ostrich, Bubble Crab, Crystal Snail, Morph Moth, and Magna Centipede. This 100% order requires no backtracking at all, and the best part of this is, this isn't the only way to do it. For this video, I once again recorded three runs, the second of which was just me playing the game in a completely different order that also resulted in zero backtracking that gave the player an equal strategic advantage as the one I use. The game has such open-ended design because the items have an immense variety in how you collect them. In X1, there wouldn't be a point to not starting with Chill Penguin because that's where the dash is, and many other items require the dash, or something that requires the dash to get. Not to say there was no variety, but still, not nearly as much as X2, where my second run of the video started with Crystal Snail because you just need to boost over this gap with the right armor to get the heart tank and drop into this pit to get the head parts. Things that don't require anything from another stage. From there, I could go to Flame Stag's level, Bubble Crabs, Wire Sponges, or in any old order and get all their collectibles and come out on top. I used to think you needed the Strike Chain to get the Crystal Snail heart tank, but I was wrong about that. You just need a well-timed jump. I used to think you had to backtrack to Bubble Crab stage to use his charged special weapon to get this sub tank, but I was also wrong about that as you can just jump to this cliff and climb up to get it. Lots of stages have multiple ways to get their upgrades, like in Wheel Gator's level where you could use the foot parts found in Overdrive Ostrich's stage to get the arm parts, but you need Wheel Gator's weapon to get that. So worry not, gamers. You can just use the strike change from Wire Sponge to grab the ledge just the same. Later in the level, you might think you need a charged speed burner to get the heart tank, but this suspiciously placed enemy is actually all you need. Let him hit you and use the invincibility frames to climb up to get the heart tank. It's genius. Like I said, the game is full of this stuff, and this is why I enjoy playing X2 so much and what I think of when reflecting on why this game is so incredible. As I said, the game has afforded such open-endedness with its varied item collection, but I think another key element is the boss design. I said the bosses in X1 were a fun challenge with minimal upgrades, but doing that in a playthrough meant to maximize efficiency would be pretty difficult given bosses as tough as Launch Octopus or Armored Armadillo. In X2, a challenge run like that is also fun in its own merits for the same reasons as X1, but bustering bosses in X2 as a part of my stage order is far less daunting than it would be in X1 or X3 because there are really balanced bosses in this game. I don't like the battle against Wheel Gator since the whole gimmick is him going underwater and you have to try and goad him into coming back up so you can get hits in, but besides that I think these bosses are best enjoyed without weaknesses anyway. 
I remember when I first battled Crystal Snail with just the Buster. It was really satisfying because you realize he'll start the fight by shooting Energy Blast towards you. My strategy being, dash under the shot while shooting, which does the damage of a charge shot like I said in the X1 video, but then quickly dash back and repeat as many times as you can without getting hit. You can also get the poor guy's shell off and bounce it around the room while he chases it. The artist had a lot of fun with that one. Then there are fights like Morph Moth, where he starts in a cocoon and has all these crazy attacks you gotta dodge, but then when he's taken enough damage, he'll emerge from the cocoon and start flying around the arena. Magna Centipede being one of the most interesting Mega Man X bosses, as every time he grabs you, he'll take one of your moves away, whether that be the charge shot, the dash, and eventually the jump. With weaknesses, you just don't see that sort of thing, and that's a bummer. But I think this game isn't as bad with the Spark Mandrill Syndrome, because the patterns do reset, but not to the laughable extreme of the last game, or other Mega Man games. But while we're on the subject of bosses, this was the game I was most curious about when going into the X Complete Works and Maverick Hunter's Field Guide. For X1, we at least have Maverick Hunter X to give us an idea of what these characters are like, and then X3 and onward just have a little more story in general. But for X2, I've never read any supplementary material related to it. First, I want to mention something eye-opening. Apparently, they wanted to have boss design submissions be open to the public for X1 and X2, like they did in the classic games. But by X2, they realized the X series was better off with designs birthed and refined by trained artists and not kids. I'm bringing this one up because I always wondered why X2 and X3 just never had credits for the people who made the game. You just get this cast list of characters in the game, but not the people who actually made it. X1 had credits, but this public art thing is why they made an exception. Apparently, Capcom in this era didn't like crediting people for their work, and I'm thinking, what kind of screwed up company does this? But it was interesting to say the least. Overall, I find the art design and aesthetic of X2 more refined and consistent than X1, as you see this game has a whole host of different poses for X, which, like the first game, look really cool in the art book. But as for the personalities of the Mavericks, this one caught my attention. Did you know that Overdrive Ostrich was once able to fly, but suffered an injury that cost him the ability? But Sigma building up his confidence caused him to go Maverick. I certainly didn't. Wheel Gator used to be a Maverick Hunter, but his violent tendencies got him axed from the group. Wire Sponge is really childish by nature, and so Sigma stationed him at a weather control center to make sure his destruction could at least be productive. The funniest one for me was that Bubble Crab joined Sigma's Maverick Rebellion because he'll do anything if it, quote, helped pad his bank account. And that just got me thinking. These guys have bank accounts? I mean, humans still exist in the Mega Man world. Can you just imagine if you're an ordinary bank teller and then this two-foot-tall robot crab walks in looking to check his balance? On that note, all this talking of least backtracking and routing and accessible bosses for the sake of these routes does beg the question of how worthwhile these collectibles actually are. I can't really comment on heart tanks and sub tanks again because they're the same collectibles they were before, but what I really need to talk about is the four parts of the second armor you'll find in Dr. Light's capsules hidden in the stages. You have the dash at default in this game, but you unlock the ability to air dash with the foot parts, something that's a great platforming tool, like here in X-Hunter Stage 1. The body parts have the same damage reduction property as before, but now you can convert that damage into a giga attack. Not something worth using outside of specific boss fights, but it's cool. The best of all be the arm parts. Seriously, my favorite arm parts in the series is you can charge your buster to a third level, which allows you to shoot two charge shots back to back, which bypasses invincibility frames. It's wildly powerful and useful throughout the entire game. But then, there's the head parts. This allows you to send out a signal which picks up on the location of secrets. It's an okay idea, but then in practice it barely works. First, you can't fire the X-Buster while using it, so you can't defend yourself. But then, the bigger problem is that when I tried using it, it still didn't work. I know there's a sub-tank right above me here, but it's not activating. Or here in Bubble Crab stage, I'm trying to make the game tell me the sub-tank is above me, but instead the signal just runs towards the opening of a hidden area that has a health drop in it. Maybe it only is for secret areas, but then I think that's stupid. The special weapon from the Maverick bosses are also not great. Many of them only ever see use as a way to grab items like the spin wheel and present little combat utility because of the arm parts being that great. The damage output for weapons like the Speed Burner or Rate of Fire, like in the case of the Silk Shot, is usually just too low to warrant using in combat. And a weapon like the Strike Chain barely works the way it's supposed to. Like, look at this. But I don't mind weapons being very situational at the end of the day, it's just something I've always noticed about this game in comparison to the first game where all the weapons were really powerful in combat. I'm betting you're noticing some hypocrisy right now, but we can save that for later. Even the charge shot variations of these weapons don't really do much for me, outside of instantly killing mini-bosses or using them to collect items. Just not a great selection. But I guess weapons like the Sonic Slicer or the Spin Wheel were inevitably going to look lame considering the fact that they're outclassed by the only special weapon you'll ever need. The Lawnmower 4.0 from Manscaped, who is the sponsor of today's video. Manscaped is a leading brand around the world in men's grooming and hygiene needs, 
For this video, they sent me a plethora of products included in their all-in-one performance package 4.0, including their Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer, the Crop Preserver deodorant and the Crop Reviver toner spray, both for use on your Mega Busters. The most important part of the set, though, is the aforementioned Lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer. This trimmer is waterproof and uses skin-safe technology which helps prevent nicks and cuts on sensitive areas of the body. It even comes with a cordless charging station and neat LED lights on the front. For a limited time, you get everything I've mentioned thus far and you get the Shed Travel Bag as well as the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. It's a steal. And remember, the holiday season is on the way. Who knows how bad shipping delays are going to be this year, so I say it's never too early to look around for the perfect gifts. Or maybe you're just in need of new grooming products yourself. Either way, the offer from Manscaped is a hard one to pass up if you ask me. To get your performance package today, go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code Jay's Reviews. All one word, all uppercase, no apostrophe. Do yourself a favor, scroll down to the link at the top of the description or the pinned comment section and check them out. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the show. The developers of X2 wanted to take advantage of the extra power the Super Nintendo was capable of via its CX4 chip. This didn't really have much of an effect on the gameplay besides these wireframe effects. You first see this in the intro and then the title screen, and then two whole bosses in the game using it. It looks neat for the time, and I love using the Charged Sonic Slicer on the mini boss here as it destroys the thing in one hit. I normally wouldn't bring attention to this sort of thing, but I did because one of my gripes with X1 was those occasional moments that dropped the performance. X2 is an interesting one because across all my playthroughs over the years, and there are many, sometimes the game runs worse than X1 like on the Wii U, but other times bosses like this one will run just fine when I have a bad experience with it on other platforms. At one point my game just crashed, but I'll blame that on the emulator the console I played this on. The soundtrack for X2 is pretty disappointing compared to the first game. The X1 music was just so great with its instrumentation, but X2 ditches that for this new one that has such a whiny quality to it. You guys know me, music and I are like oil and vinegar, but here what I'm trying to say is, X1 music was way better. However, X2 music isn't bad by any means. I think there are a lot of hits in the soundtrack, such as... But like I said, the way it sounds is just inferior to X1, that's just how I feel about it. With all that said, we've reached the end game of Mega Man X2 and I haven't even talked about one of its main gimmicks. Earlier in the video I discussed the X-Hunters, the Maverick leaders who challenged X to face them in exchange for Zero's body. How this works in game is that after stage 2, the X-Hunters will each appear in a stage, as seen on the world map. In my route, I go to Flamestag for stage 3 and Sergei's will always appear there. I don't really factor the X-Hunters in my route since you'll eventually come across them in a stage, so if their appearance happens to be where I'm going, then I'll fight them. But be careful though, you have to actually locate the X-Hunter boss arenas, and if you beat the stage they were in without fighting them, you'll lose your chance to beat that X-Hunter, thus forfeiting the best ending. Beating all three of them will give you access to Zero's full body, but that doesn't really do anything at the moment. I like the system here, it doesn't get in the way of the game, as if you want to keep the pace of the game going, you can just ignore them and suffer the small consequence later. If you do go after them, it adds the extra bit of exploration to your runs of the stages. It's good stuff. But anyway, once all eight stages are done, you know the drill. You have to face the X-Hunters for the final time at their HQ. If you have all the upgrades, you should get through these stages pretty easily since you have the air dash, the arm parts, the expanded health bar, all that. But if you don't, these levels are actually a pretty big difficulty spike. I was just saying that a minimalist run of X2 in the Maverick stages will be pretty easy going, until you get to the final stages where you have to navigate through crushing walls, spike rooms, flamethrowers, pits, multiple pathways, these flying platforms, and the kitchen sink. It is cool how these obstacles are all ones you've seen before in the game, just with a harder difficulty. All I'm saying is that with the minimal loadout, you'll probably find these levels much harder than the ones that came before. X-Hunter Stage 4 also brings the boss rush back to the usual Mega Man style where it's all 8 bosses in one room. I've made it a thing that I don't like these segments multiple times, but I finally put my finger on why that is. It's not just the blatantly recycled content at the end of the day, because honestly, in a game like Mega Man 2, the bosses die in 10 seconds and explode at triple that speed. So I don't really care as much as I do in a game like X2 where it lasts an eternity. First, the bosses have to drop in and do their little intro, then their weakness takes forever to kill them because of the invincibility frames, but the worst part is at the end. That god damn explosion.
Between getting the last hit in and warping back to the room, you will wait 15 seconds. Doesn't sound like a lot. And when beating a Maverick in their stage, I agree. But here? Oh no. During this boss rush, you will sit there and watch explosions for 15 seconds each. 15 seconds times 8 bosses equals 2 minutes of explosions. That is the reason I find these boss refights to be such a pace breaker. Glad I could finally nail that one down. So let's backtrack a bit as I was talking about these stages being pretty hard if you don't know what you're doing. If you have all the upgrades, there is a secret waiting for you. In X Hunter Stage 3, you'll reach this point where you need Crystal Snail's weapon to turn these bats into a platform you can use to climb up this ladder that will bring you to this point. At full health, charge up Speed Burner, air dash to the right, and then use the charged Speed Burner to the left and you'll have cleared this obstacle. By clinging to this wall, you'll find the fifth light capsule where you get the Shoryuken, also a move from a Street Fighter that kills bosses in one hit, like X1. This being perfect for the boss of X Hunter Stage 3. I didn't really comment on the Maverick Stage versions of the X Hunter bosses because they were pretty easy to deal with. For the Castle Stages, the Violin Refight will wreck you unless you use a charged Bubble Splash. The Sergei's Refight in Stage 2 sees you destroying this machine with either the Silk Shot or the Giga Attack. And then you have to stand underneath him here and use charged Sonic Slicers. Another pretty easy one. But the ending of this boss is worth bringing up. All the X Hunters upon death just say a generic line about a prophecy, but that's because the translation of X2 isn't that great. X1 didn't have that much dialogue, so this wasn't as much of a thing in the last game, but now we have X2, a game with far more cutscenes, and you see how wooden the dialogue can be at times. And this one's a big annoyance of mine. I guess to not confuse the kids or something, they have every character call X, Mega Man X, and then X3 just has Mega Man in the text box whenever X is speaking. As far as the other characters are concerned, X is just X, no Mega Man about it. If the intention was to make kids not confused by these two being separate characters, I think conflating them more is a really ineffective solution. But back to the X Hunters. Just by looking at this guy, you might think he has some resemblance to Dr. Wily from the classic series. Just maybe. But in the Japanese script, Sergis says he's being beaten by another one of Light's robots or something like that, directly confirming that this is Wily Reborn. Is that not more interesting than him not being that? I don't know what the translation team was thinking there. Sergei's was obviously the brains behind bringing Zero back to life, so what does that say about Zero? That Dr. Wily is familiar with his systems. All questions for later games. But we don't get that in the English script. Speaking of Zero, as I've been saying, he's brought back to life in this game, and you can already tell just how much Keiji Inafune loves Zero. I mean, he tells the story of getting his design approved in the X1 portion of the art book, and then while making X2, he's just like, hey, sure would be a waste to get rid of such a good character design. <laughs> and bam, he's in the game. Only, his design was slightly updated with shoulder pads in this game, but still, it's Zero. If you got all of Zero's parts, Dr. Kane rebuilds Zero, who saves you from this fake Zero that Sigma has, who's also back to life, by the way. But if you didn't, you have to fight Zero before the final boss to bring him back to your side. As I said, I like this system because if you want to make the Maverick levels quicker, then you can avoid the X Hunters, but if you do, you get a tough boss that might potentially drain your resources right before the final battle. Either way, Zero's back and X takes the fight to Sigma yet again with Street Fighter moves. Sigma coming back was foreshadowed at the end of X1 where he says in the post credit scene that he has multiple bodies he can return with. The final battle of X2 showing Sigma's true form at this point being this computer essence that you can never truly be rid of, but it is stopped in the short term as X and Zero make it out just in time. I always thought this ending was kind of weird. It's obviously very reminiscent of the first game, only it just ends in this note of the future holds the answers or... Uh, yeah? Guess that's their sequel hook. As it stands, that's a hella unfinished sentence. Besides that, I don't really know what else to say about Mega Man X2. I think the game is simply incredible. What I loved about X1 was how well designed and cohesive the whole thing felt while taking every step they could to make it feel like a next generation experience compared to what came before. X2 does all that again with more exciting set pieces, varied platforming, and more accessible and streamlined game design that provides me with everything I look for in a Mega Man game, and that's replayability. Mega Man X2, just like X1, is a game I have played countless times in the last six going on seven years because it's just a fantastic game that I recommend to anyone who's into retro 2D platformers. Is it better than X1? I don't know, and I don't care. I think both games are two of my favorite games of all time. So what difference does it make? And that's how I feel about X2, and maybe some won't agree since I think the popular opinion on this game is that it's definitely on the good list, but nothing super stand out. I, however, think it's amazing, as this video has said, and what the old video should have said. Yeah, a good topic transition on my show, who could imagine? I said in the X1 review that I didn't want to focus on why these old videos failed so much in comparison to the new ones. 
but I figured the X2 video was the perfect spot to talk about it for just the briefest bit since it is worth bringing up. When I was remaking the Ratchet videos earlier this year, looking back on the old ones wasn't really something that brought me much shame. It was instead something I could look back and laugh at since it was so early in my career that you could laugh at it and enjoy it for what it is, a representation of my limited skills at the time. Now maybe you could laugh at a lot of the other older videos I've done as well, but starting with Sly 4 in 2016, I think my work changed quite a bit. Those videos are still old by today's standards, but the Mega Man X videos or the MGS videos were just technically more competently put together than the earlier stuff. But I don't really enjoy looking back on them. Now, I owe a lot to them and the people who watch them and enjoy them because without that we wouldn't be here right now. I just want to address something that has changed about my channel in 2020 and 2021. Perhaps you noticed it, perhaps you didn't. What we're talking about right now is that in late 2016, 17, 18, going into 2019 even, I'd say much of my content was consistently negative. I still make negative reviews today on games like Secret Agent Clank or Sonic and the Secret Rings, but let me tell you something. Mega Man X, X2, and X3 are three of my favorite games of all time, and they have been since I first played them in 2015. But if you watched my videos on them, then you'd have no idea of this fact, because all I do is say negative things about these games, and so many more. At that time, I was going through a phase on my channel where I felt I had to be as analytical as possible, which meant being as critical as possible. I'd go off on X2 over the fact that the X-Hunters in the stages don't give you a reward. Newcomers might die to the X1 bosses without the dash. Slide two clue bottles might take someone a long time to find. And like, I don't care about these things. I'm just saying it because it's more analytical to focus on the faults of things that you like. Now, I believe criticizing the things you like is the only way for them to improve. But at the same time, the point of this channel is just for me to share my perspective on games, my history with them and how I feel playing them now. So if I don't care about slide two clue bottles as it has no effect on my experience, why even get mad about it? MGS4 is a video where I'm practically tearing my hair out over the tiniest of inconsistencies. I mean, who cares? Game's really polished. Not my thing, but still. Now, I put a lot of work into all these videos, but I do feel bad because I feel like I made bad faith arguments with the intent to sound more analytical. Something that affected my videos for a long time. Not even consciously, it's just how I thought I had to do it. I don't exactly remember when this comment was posted, but I just remember this comment on the Mega Man Zero One review that came in last year, or two years ago, or whatever, that read, why has he said more positive things briefly summing up the X series than he did in his full reviews? That one really got me. Because it's true! Why is it that my love of the Mega Man X series isn't something you can feel listening to me talk about them in the old videos? Well, it's because I'm screaming over whether or not Command Mission is canon when there's a perfectly logical explanation for the whole thing. So, if you like all those old videos, that's perfectly fine. I have nostalgia for the old days of being in high school making those videos in Mega Man X7 in 2017 or MGS4 in 2019. I really do. It's just that on a creative level, I feel like it was just forcing myself to act in a way that was unnatural for me, when I just want to talk about games. So when I get to a game like Sonic 06, yeah, it's one of the biggest disasters in the history of games, but I can't help but enjoy it. It was one of my favorite games as a kid. Am I supposed to just pretend it wasn't? Nowadays, I just focus on saying how I feel, no ifs and or buts about it. I honestly feel like that aspect of things has improved my content as I'm just being more true to myself than I was when I was being ultra critical of everything. I want these X reviews to focus on the positive energy a lot because when it comes to Mega Man X, that's how I feel. Having said that, I'm glad I got to air out that little grievance with my older content since I think it was important to address why the attitude of my videos changed so much in 2020. Now you know. X2 is a pretty guilty example since that was a very harsh video on a game that is really good. I never want to treat a game I enjoy like that again. Which is why I think this review of the four is going to be the most different from the original. And that is why I thought X2 was the perfect spot to finally talk about this. But you know the drill. I don't have much else to say at this point, so I'm just going to close it off by saying that when making YouTube content, just try to be yourself and say how you feel. Not everyone will agree with you. Some might laugh at you, and that's fine. But it's just video games at the end of the day. So, say your opinions. On that note, the next video is going to be on Mega Man X3, one of my favorite games of all time, that is also a very flawed game on a fundamental level, which makes it the perfect game to follow up this video's conclusion with. In the meantime, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. As always, I'd like to thank the patrons who make this video possible. The Tier 2 patrons are getting their names displayed on the screen right now, and the Tier 3 patrons pay extra to get their names read out loud. Those being... Caleb Escobar, Chris Delgado, Hazel Zero, Aaron the Atom, Peregree, The Squeaker Nerd, Protector of Memes, Daxtry A. Velencourt, Jepson 2.0, Keiko Blur, Kyler Lehman, Bo Blocks, Joe, Michael Caboose, Ya Boy Joe, Avatar Aiden YT, Icarus 10032, The G Wizard, It's Time to Sue, and Uriel Moody. Thanks again. But you know, I was thinking. Earlier in this video, I was talking about how these Mavericks all have bank accounts now, apparently. 
But then, what would those cheesy bank ads look like in the world of 21XX? The result, I think it'd be something like this. Hi, I'm the chief financial officer at this bank and I'd like to show you a normal day at this bank in 21XX. Now that society has become so diverse as to include humans, free-thinking robots, and even free-thinking robots based on animals. Wait, free-thinking... Who wrote this c Well, anyway, blah, blah, blah. We're devoted to quality service, such as... Well, Mr. Krabs, since you put the down payment on that nuclear submarine with the lasers, the bombs, and the heart-shaped jacuzzi... It... You weren't supposed to know about that! Well, either way, you've exceeded your credit limit by 14,605 with interest. Yo, squid Bubble Crab, please! It was all Wire Sponge's idea! Welcome to Bank of America, sucking you dry since 1990X.